Hello, and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski, and today I am talking to the amazing Joe Nadin. We're talking about relationships and the PhD, and in particular, intimate relationships. Um, we're talking about the challenges that doing a PhD may bring to personal relationships, and also the love affair that you have with the PhD itself. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Joe. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. It's a really busy time of term and I really appreciate you taking time to come to talk to us about a really important conversation. I get a, a topic rather. I get a lot of questions about this and I'm, I'm so pleased that we're going to be able to sort of address this now. But before we go into that, I always ask people to tell us a little bit about their own story. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey into through and out the other side of the PhD? Okay, so I think I come from it from an unusual angle. In Love it. <laughs> I haven't, I wasn't an academic for many years. I got encouraged to do a PhD when I was only, what, 22 on the, uh, towards the end of my master's. But I'd got offered a job as a runner in television. Love that. And I was like, oh, but come on, TV. This was the <laughs> 90s. And so I just thought, oh, it's fine. I'll just, I'll do it. I'll, I'll come back to it, do it in a couple of years. And of course, I got lost down the rabbit hole that is broadcasting mm. and mm. kind of put it to one side. I just thought, okay, maybe having been brought up thinking you're the, I mean, literally being told you're a clever girl, not a pretty girl. Oh, and I just assumed, oh, don't even. <laughs> I, That's a whole other episode, I right? Another episode. Um, assuming I'd go into something where the job was being clever it was suddenly like being told okay you are one of the cool kids now you can work in telly mm. so that's what I I did and it turned out I didn't really love working in telly so I tried radio and I did like that better but it was still not great so I ended up in politics which was probably um another place with all the nerdy kids and I actually <laughs> did love that for many years but I'd my first degree was in drama. I was uh, a bookworm. I was a creative person. And while, I mean, it was literally in my first year, and I was a special advisor to the prime minister, basically. What? I, 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 yes, I moved. I left radio, went to the Labour Party as a, a campaigns writer, and within a year and a half moved to Downing Street to be a spad. Um, this was back in the, in the Blair years. And... That first summer, you know, they go on they go on a long summer holiday and I was very bored. So in my <laughs> audacity, I thought, I'm so bored, I'm going to write a book. What's the shortest book I can write in, you know, in the however many weeks they've got oh, off, 10 so, weeks. Oh, so I wrote, I thought, I'll write a kid's book. And I did. And I mean, it sounds, oh, it just sounds ridiculous. And also a bit, oh, look at me. But I know it doesn't. It sounds amazing. It was all, all of my career moves have been sort of happy accidents. Anyway, I sent it off. I ended up with an agent and a publisher. And I, for many years, had a secondary career writing kids book, kids Ooh. books alongside politics. And then I got pregnant and had a wonderful baby girl in 2003 and it, by 2005 was finding living in London with a kid really really hard work and working right. full-time right in Downing right. Street through right. the, the Afghan war years it was it was just not great so I went freelance and moved down to Bath in the West Country and became a full-time writer and I was a speech writer political speech writer alongside mm -hmm writing novels and this I'm, I'm eventually getting to the PhD bit no I promise I'm, I am so enjoying this journey <laughs> it's so it's such a roundabout route anyway for many years I very successfully wrote children's books 
um, until we got to about, it must have been about 2011, 2012. So I've been full-time writing since 2005 and I've been published since 2003. And I was sitting thinking, this is weird. My royalty statements, the money is just, I'm selling more books than I used to, but my money is going down. Mm. Um, so I literally, in the sort of nerdy fashion, I got out my royalty statements and I did lots of maths. And I realized that because of massive Amazon discounts, I was never going to make the money that I used to make. Right. And potentially, I was uh, also, I was a single parent by this point right. and had been since 2006, right. thinking, oh, this is, uh, much as I love writing books, this is precarious. I'm the sole provider. I was getting no money from her father. Mm. You know, I need a steady job. Mm. And at that point, I thought, I'll go into academia. <laughs> <laughs> looking back was probably not the wisest <laughs> it's paid off but it's taken a while but right, it, that right, was honestly right. what I thought I thought this is going to be an easy way to have a steady income stream I'm like, <laughs> okay. I will pause for laughter there <laughs> yes <laughs> and I was very lucky because I was living in Bath we had a very very um strong in fact we have the world leading masters in writing for young people at Bath Spa Uni and a friend of mine was running it because and I'd thought because it'd been so long since my master's and my master's was in political communications. Right. And I thought, OK, if I do a PhD, what will it be in? I'll probably need to do another MA because I don't know enough about anything. It's all okay. fallen out of my brain right. because I've been thinking about politics and kids books. And my friend said, you do know you can do a PhD in creative writing. Mm -hmm. And I did not mm -hmm. until that point. And um, hooray for that made, friend! Hooray for that friend! And I applied and got a place. Um, and I got a place at the point when they hadn't cottoned on to the disparity between part-time fees and full-time fees. So full-time fees were about five or six grand a year. Mm. Part-time fees were five hundred pounds a year. Hello. So <laughs> I signed up part-time and did it in full-time time. Yes, yes, yes. It's just why thought, well, you know, you? why wouldn't you? So I did my, I did do my PhD in three years, but I came to it because, yes, from a very roundabout, circuitous wow. route through politics and writing fiction, oh. because I wanted a proper job, and I am now sitting in my proper office at at Bristol Uni, but it's taken oh. quite a while to get here. I love it. I love that story. Um. And I, I love that because I think so often these are the stories that we have on the podcast and, and but the, the dominant narrative is there is there is a there's a linear trajectory and you start here and you end up <laughs> there. And that, that very rarely happens. And actually look at the gorgeousness and the richness that you now yes. bring to your work. How fantastic. And, is and that? so many colleagues. And that's what I love about this yes. job is that so many people, especially I think in practice led subjects yes. Yes. do come from all over the place and yes. it, it makes it a very rich place to learn as well for our students yes 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 and it's that sense of you you go I, I know I was trained to be a therapist but, and people kind of get desperate to sort of start their therapy training and this sense of 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 being told you're already starting on your training like right? you already started on yeah. your PhD journey back 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 yes but then you register at a certain point and so knowing that, because I know there'll be people listening who are kind of want to get going, but there's funding issues and things like that. It's like, you've already started, you're on your journey. You'll be telling this it kind of story. It all builds to it yeah. completely. It yeah. all feeds into it. Yeah. Um, so this is this is a, a story with a lot of success and a lot to celebrate in it. But the particular thing that we wanted to talk about today um, is is the the kind of the, the impact on relationships of, of the PhD. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to let you lead that off and, and, and tell us a bit about your experience of that and your perspective on that. Okay. I will, I mean, it's ha it has had an effect both on romantic relationships and family mm. relationships. Mm. The one it didn't so much was with me and my daughter she I waited until right. she was about to start secondary so she started secondary just as I started my 
PhD at a point right. where I felt I had enough freedom because there is no way I could have held down a day job and done the PhD when she was small. It was mm. it would have been one thing mm. too many. Mm. Mm. So I did wait until I mean I I say that, but then she needed huge mental health help, and right. so right. It, it you know it wasn't as easy as all that. But so yes. that but that relationship has only benefited from me being in a university, so she could see it was a place for her. And she, I dropped her off last Saturday at uni. So, oh, amazing! Um, it's been yeah, oh, it's it's so weird and terrifying. Um, <laughs> Don't tell me. I'm trying to pretend it's never going to happen it's, to me. It happens. It happens. <laughs> and it, it makes me look at my new students in a very different mm. way and feel incredibly maternal towards them and I just bet. worry. Um, but it did. It was very strange when I I think because it's partly because people see you as what they want to see you as. And yes. I was yes very much the child my parents had painted me or I tried to live up to the child that they painted me which was the clever Mm -hmm. child so they were very confused when I worked in telly I think happier when I was in politics and they and they did love that I wrote books um Mm -hmm. as well although I think that my my mother would have preferred if I wrote a proper book by which she meant a book for (laughs) grown-ups which is a common common issue but when I said I'm going to go and do a doctorate it, their reaction was why why on earth would you do that mm. and they couldn't understand why I would potentially have you know have left politics and then gone and, and done this precarious thing and then done something even it, there wasn't they couldn't see where the money was and, right. and it's all about safety and money right so right. and I do understand that reaction their immediate reaction was to try to give me money Right. Because they were so worried that I was going to be an impoverished student. Right. Again, right. which I refused because, you know, I did I did have another income stream. I was writing, I was still writing books throughout the PhD. I had wow. to because no one else was going to, you know, pay yeah. my rent or yeah. my mortgage by that point. Yeah. So that, I think it, it, I mean, it certainly altered. They were, they were incredibly excited and, and proud, but the, it just made them worry even more. And I, I probably quite rightly, because it is, as I have discovered, a horribly precarious um, mm. place, not mm. just doing the PhD, but academia, especially early career mm. researcher. Mm. And as a hourly paid um, lecturer, which I was for several years. Yeah. Yeah. But it was yeah. the, it was actually the romantic relationships that I mean, I'm single now, which frankly says it all. Um, (laughs) But when I started, I was seeing someone I'd been with him for a couple of years. We had very, very different backgrounds. He he had to leave school at 15 to care for his many siblings. Um, His mother had died. Um, So we came from, yes, I'd already, you know, I was already totally outside his realm of experience right. um in in many ways right but it didn't it didn't seem to matter and then suddenly when I said I was going to be doing a doctorate it wasn't that he thought it was wrong or odd it was that it sort of gave him a green light to to give up on doing anything of his own mm. in a very strange sort of I remember him mm. saying I'm going to go back to the pub where, you know, where I grew up and say, yeah, what are all you lot doing? I'm going out with a doctor. Wow. And it's like, yeah, but but you're not doing the thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the thing. Yeah. Why yeah. don't you do something that you really want yeah. to do? And it was like a carte blanche to just not bother doing anything. Right. And, wow. Wow. And, and also, I, and I started... I guess I started hanging around with other students, mm-hmm. a lot of whom were much younger than me, but the our convers- suddenly my conversations had gone from what was on telly last night and football and vegetarian food to Freud and mm. Derrida and Lacan and how flaming complicated they are. Mm. And he couldn't mm. join in. Mm. And mm. I also completely, I'd, I'd not really drunk 
alcohol for a long time for health reasons, but I gave it up completely at that point because I just I just thought I just want a clear head all the time. Right, right. Um, and he drank. He was quite a heavy drinker, and so I think the combination of doing the doctorate and the and, right. and not drinking at all, and it was a very much we are very different mm. people. Mm. And that was the beginning of a sort of an odd, I suppose not the beginning of the end. I have had relationships <laughs> since then. That was back in 2014, we broke up. But it's they've been clouded in by, uh, because none of the people I've gone out with have had a doctorate or have had academic persuasions one actually claimed he did and I found out it was an absolute lie he's never done anything wow. like that it was bizarre well, the but world it was is a very... funny place isn't it <laughs> yes and I don't know if it was because of the doctorate or because of the of my really poor judgment and and just I'm I'm not a good judge of character but I picked I there was a lot of um control issues and the more successful I got, the, mm. the worse it sort of mm. got. I mean, it's so successful. I've done a PhD in creative writing. It's not like I've, you know, cured anything or solved any big mm. mystery or, mm. although mm. I just, by the same token, I don't want to belittle the achievement because no. no, a doctorate is a doctorate. Yeah. But yeah. it's, they, it, it's very, it, it does something weird to, yes. to men. In a way, it didn't to any of my female friends at all it, right. it's just and now having very recently decided to you know given that my daughter has just left home I thought okay it is time I must try to date mm. and be a human again but holy ex- insert expletive here that being either you lie and don't say that you have a postgrad qualification but if you say you are a doctor, then it's that you're ruling out right. most of the male population right. again. Right. So right. it's which it sounds pompous, and it absolutely isn't because it's no, it's it's just it does it. This just the word seems to do something. Even saying that you're an academic, it yeah, it's easy just to say I write for kids, and then yeah. there's the common ground. It it seems to be off putting but it is a thing it is a thing and I think just I'm glad glad it's not just me saying it oh no 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 (laughs) no I totally hear you I totally hear you um uh so this this and I think it comes back to what you start off with this 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 people see you as they want to see you and the projections that are going to happen and I as I say, I I know from my own experience, and I know from lots of people that I've talked to that this is a, this is a common thing, but it doesn't really get talked about. And then it then people feel like it's just them, and there's something wrong with them. And actually, I think there's something about the PhD process, and then even being, as you say, being having a doctorate. So there's there's the kind of the two things there. But I think the sense of projection that goes on. Um, and that can be really positive, like you say. People could be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, but then distance themselves from you. Like, you're so amazing. You're over there being amazing. Yeah. I can't be with you. And that, that can be really um, unsettling in in long-term relationships. And I think it's not unusual that people go into doctoral programs and there are there's, there's, there's changes that happen it has to change because you are changing you you are changing yeah you know I always say the PhD is a personal development program that is what it is it changes you um and so the the changes will need to happen and I think for some couples they're able to negotiate that and negotiate the change and for other couples it 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 it's something that kind of uh becomes part of a of a discussion that can't be resolved because of the things that Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It's because of not being able to share yeah. the things that you become fascinated yeah. by when you're doing your PhD because they seem so esoteric and meaningless to, yeah. to someone who's not studying them. And, and I suppose I just wanted to hang out with people who didn't see them as meaningless, who got as excited about, I mean, my PhD was about, in fact, it was about 
the formation of self and how we're formed in dialogue with other people and how we change and we become different people depending on who we're with. Right. And I think that was massively summed up in the PhD yeah, process, yeah. in fact, because I became, at certain times of the day, I was academic, Joe, and then I got home and I was Mushma, I was my I was the mother, Joe, yeah. and I, I'm all these different yeah. people, but I really, I wanted them to see and to get the academic yeah. Joe. And so many people just couldn't or didn't want to. Yeah. And there's a lot of, I mean, I see it sometimes when I look at, I was yesterday, I read an academic paper on the social construction of freezers in Finland in the 1950s. <laughs> you know, and it was for book research. And I did, part of me thought, who does this? Yeah. Who the hell, right? And then I thought, but I needed to read this. Yes. So actually, yes. thank God someone does think about these tiny, weird, little yes, yes, yes. corners of, of thinking. Yes. And it's, yeah, it's just, I want, I need someone to, I suppose, yeah, I'm not. I'm not here to, you know, as a dating plea. But I need but, to find someone. But, but I need someone who can there. share. Yeah, who can share an academic excitement at learning still. At, you know, I'm 52 now, and I'm still learning, which is why I love teaching because I learn from my students, and I love seeing them learn and get things. And yeah. I don't want to give up. And I and I think that's the that felt like one of the biggest changes in relationships with people who were happy with stasis and had settled. And that was great. And I'm really pleased that they can be happy with that. And I've just always got itchy feet to, mm. and not in terms of traveling. I'm not, I'm a homebody, but I've got itchy feet in terms of learning because there's so much to learn. And I, and I, I've, you know, I haven't got that many years left and I want to keep, I want to yeah. keep going. And I think, and I think that sense of, you know, talk about it a lot that kind of PhD is, you know, it means lover of learning and this sense of your commitment to that, that is a big love in your life. And I yeah. say your life, I mean, your life. And I mean, all of our collective lives as academics, we love that. It is a love affair that we have. And yeah. it's negotiating the other relationships around that. Um, and that can be a real challenge. Um, and I, I just think to to really share that message of th this, this is really common and it is it is challenging to do that. And and there are ways that you can invite your partner in if they w want to be in that yeah. um and and there may be there may be difficult conversations to be had um exactly but and it, i think and you're right this thing is i hadn't thought about it that that i had a relationship with the phd that was yeah yeah <laughs> that was absolutely. my main relationships during that period of the yeah. phd were with the, my daughter and my phd yeah and actually that's fine Right. as well it's fine to feel like that's your main yeah. love affair and and also because frankly being single is pretty great as well I have to say so <laughs> I just I know I well if this was if this was a podcast about how to make relationships good I'm I think actually I'm probably the wrong wrong guest <laughs> <laughs> because mine is yay for being single while you do your PhD because I think it makes it a lot easier in so many ways although I would have loved but that's because I didn't have someone who could be either supportive with my with child care or supportive with my thinking and learning I didn't have someone who could be that for me basically right. I had instead I formed very very close friendships with other people doing their PhD at the same time and we became a support group mm. unsurprisingly two of those were also single women in their 40s right. and we right. became each other's sort of sounding board and agony gorgeous. aunt I guess how gorgeous and I, I always want to give shout outs to to people's support people yes. their wing people because they these are the people that can really get you through really get through and as, as you say for some people that will be the partner that they begin that PhD journey with so that it really does work for some people it does, but I, I suppose yeah. the message really is this sense of that sometimes it doesn't and that's could be part of the process and that is okay and you will be okay um because I think that um 
for some people it takes them by surprise but you are entering into a real transitional phase completely I was a different I mean we all change constantly and again that this is all to do with how self is formed but it's such it's such I mean, I am still the same person in many ways. I've still given up all the other stuff that I did and I'm still have most of my relationships with friends are exactly the same. But I am a completely different person because I've got a ton of new stuff in my brain and I yeah. see the world yeah. differently. And I yeah. constantly now see it through the lens of how self is formed and, and I'm obsessed with that. And I'm always, my my fiction revolves around that now. And it's made me it made me think about love very differently because I started to study love as part of the PhD and and it was quite disturbing at some points um so yeah you do become a you do you do grow and become a different person and and if you can grow with someone if they can grow alongside you brilliant but not everyone can and it and I suppose if you you know if that if I had to give one bit of advice about anything, it would be it's okay to do it by yourself as long as you've got your wing women or wings, yes. maybe wing men. Yeah. Mine were all wing wing women, and yeah. they will get you through. So oh, there you go. I, well, I always ask for a top tip, and we've got it. I didn't even have to ask for that. No, I've got there it. You go. No, I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> whether there's some material from your from your research that you might offer us. Um, and we can put in the show notes to help people if they want to read up more around this and kind of get more of a of a kind of contextual understanding of what that might mean and kind of them, them in relation to others and what that might mean. Because, as I say, this is very, very common. And I think if people are having um, renegotiating relationships, should we say, um, at this moment, then that is that is totally par for the course, maybe very painful. And um, that's not to say it's any easier that but it happens for lots of people it does and you're, and you're not you're not on your own no in um, fact it happens for everyone because that is how self works you form as many selves as you need in different situations so oh, I love it I love it it's oh, please, fascinating isn't it so yeah, please you know, do send have... us across some material joke that <laughs> would be awesome that'd be awesome um cool Joe, thank you so much thank you thank for you. really opening up and and sharing your own story um, I know that will be um, useful and a comfort to people who are listening. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I wish you well. Keep me posted. Thank you. <laughs> I wish you well. Thank you, Emma. Thank you all for listening. Bye.